Survival and Other Important Matters Kovie Biakolo It has been a year of poetry. By that I mean I have probably read more poetry this year than any year prior. I have also written some, though that remains a private undergoing. But a year of poetry has come partially because the year has been especially unpoetic. By that I mean if poetic is supposed to relate to poetry in its expressive ability to have a kind of pleasant sensation even when the words are sad. This year has been the opposite of this experience. The year has been challenging, and not just in a personal way, but there has been a sense that the year has been universally challenging. At least I can say of many of my friends, family, and social groups that 2016 has not been our best year ever. When I consider the stories coming out of places I have personal, political, and social ties to, I am not encouraged. When I read the news from around the world, I am continuously disheartened. Many, if not most of my undertakings, and the undertakings of loved ones, and people I know, even at the most superficial level, seem to have been met with much failure, grief, and disappointment. When fall came this year, in an attempt to bring a little light to my circles, I asked a few friends, colleagues, and acquaintances for wonderful things that had happened to them during the year. My intention was to compile them and remind us all that good and even great things have happened, even if they may not be happening to us at present. The responses I received can be summed up by a friend's email. Well, if it is still a wonderful thing to be alive, then add that. I decided to abandon the project for the time being, as it seemed that this year was a year less about wonder and more about survival. Of course, good things have happened at the personal and political level, the latter of which is even more intricate, depending on your politics. But even when these good things have happened, people falling in love and getting married and bringing children into the world, or refugees finding homes, and native protesters keeping their sacred lands undefiled, these things seem so small in weight in comparison to the personal and political burdens that remain. I often have had to remind myself this year that I am only in the latter half of my mid-twenties, that there is still much to learn, much to experience, much to become, and much to hope for. Those who know me intimately know that this too is an endeavor, having been one of those people born into the world with an old soul. A friend once humorously told me in college, you were born an old woman. I took it neither as a compliment or criticism, but rather a commentary of my manner of speaking, of being. This year, so many of us have aged a little faster and a little more than we'd like. In reflecting on the year, it has crossed my mind that it may just be the pure specific reality of growing up, the unearthing of young eyes, used to seeing the world a certain way, being replaced with older vision that, perhaps ironically, has caused us to consider the world around us and beyond us with greater clarity. It may be too, the hyper-awareness of growing up in such an age where, at least in theory, we frequently know each other's thoughts and experiences. But it's not as if I or many of my friends were sheltered from the harsh realities of the world in ways that particular privileged people, in particular privileged places, sometimes are, especially when we were young. No. 
some of my friends and I were children of politically and socially unstable national spaces and or war. Some of my friends come from broken homes or communities or have been victims of violence from the streets to the sexual kind. Some of my friends understand absolute and relative poverty and the reality of being in the world that whether because of skin or sex or sexuality or another part of an identity, what it means to be treated as less than. We are children no longer, but even before we became adults, among the people who I've known and loved, who I've always been drawn to, the darkness that sometimes consumes specific people in specific spaces for specific reasons was never a stranger to us. This is not to say that my friends and I are not privileged in different ways. Many went to good schools, if not elite schools. Many have jobs and support systems and a general sense of safety. One might not realize the importance of feeling safe unless one has also known what it's like to not be safe. I think of this every time I listen to another story of police brutality or the plight of refugees or places that are being destroyed as we speak by terrorism, war, poverty. These days, I'm thinking of Syria in particular and the people of Aleppo specifically and their lack of safety. And I'm thinking of how the international community, a shaky term for the current times, has failed them. I'm thinking of how we fail so many. We fail the survival of so many. Yet, in the midst of thinking about the people who are most in need, both near and far, I think about my own survival and the survival of my friends. And I conclude, as I have often concluded, how unevenly cruel and randomly unjust the world is in its relative and absolute distribution of pain and suffering. A few weeks ago, I got into an unexpected, brief, and loud altercation with a complete stranger. It was about my decision to give cash to a homeless man, of which the person voiced his disapproval, and loudly. I retorted, and might I add, quite wittingly. These days, likely because I feel guilt over not doing much volunteering for homelessness as I have in the past, I want to give the little cash I can directly to homeless people I encounter. Additionally, I have deduced that giving cash is the right thing to do, regardless of how that individual chooses to spend it. Because in the moment, I cannot do more. And however a homeless person chooses to spend it, they are doing it in order to survive their existence, their experience in their humanity. And that is all that matters. Survival is what matters most to de desperate people, to people in difficult situations, to people whose life, in a period or in an entire lifetime, is a delicate dance with the uncertainties of today and tomorrow. The people of Aleppo are trying to survive, as are the people of South Sudan and Yemen. Refugees are trying to survive. Venezuelans are trying to survive. Palestinians are trying to survive. Northern Nigerians are trying to survive. Black and brown and native people in many parts of this country are trying to survive. The world's poor and forgotten are trying to survive. And yet, too, somehow my family, many of my friends and their family, and I, are trying to survive too this year, in our own ways. Again, I say the world is unevenly cruel and randomly unjust in its relative and absolute distribution of pain and suffering. Because before a people or a person can achieve anything else, they must first survive in their circumstance. Of this difficult year, 
the poets have encouraged me to not go gently into that good night, to, like air, rise, to, respond to rejection by being more me, to continue to be terrifying, strange, and beautiful, something not everyone knows how to love. The poets have reminded me, as they have reminded us all, that our first duty is to survive. In this part of the world, the year begins and ends with winter. And though the circumstances of this year might have us believe that only winter has prevailed, let us remember too that we survived the changes of spring, summer and fall. For those of us who believe and celebrate, and perhaps for even those who don't, though the Advent season is a season of waiting and welcoming, and the year has felt more like the solemnity of Lenten waiting, let us be reminded that we do not have Lent without Easter and Advent without Christmas. Indeed, it has been a year of survival, and though many of us are looking forward to the closure of this year and the coming of a new start, if we can look forward still, if we still have that privilege, that means we have indeed survived, and we have survived with hope. And that, my friend, is an important matter. For hope is the thing that makes survival so sweet, so willing to become more than itself. If we hold on to it, for those who are no longer here, and for those who will come after us, hope is the thing that may still survive us all.